Hello and welcome to the Game Lore Archives. In our last episode we discussed how the world of Sanctuary was created, which means it's now time to start looking at the events and the people who helped shape the land into the places we see today. The oldest civilizations of Sanctuary are the children of Bull Cathos, whose culture was formed long before recorded history. Until very recently, their culture was not understood by outsiders, but recently a book called... I'll laugh that one for you, buddy. Brilliant. Sail Fada? That's, so. that's why, why not? Sail Fada has revealed the truth to the other civilizations. Before we give you the information from this book, check out our Patreon page for a bigger input on the channel. Last episode, we discussed how the first generation of Nephilim were immensely powerful and known as the Ancients. Uh, Bull Kathos was one of these powerful beings. We also discussed Inarus changing the way the world stone works, so the Nephilim would become weaker over time and become the human race. Many Nephilim were unsure as to why this was happening. However, Bull Kathos knew exactly what Inarius had done, and he shared this knowledge with another ancient called yeah, Fiaslagir. 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 Yeah, Sounds like a metal gear, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> Fiaslagir is more commonly known as Vasli. Which is the name we'll be using it because it's much easier to pronounce. <laughs> yeah. I believe that's the cop out name. Yeah. Bull Kathos and Vasili's exact relationship has been forgotten. However, there are two myths that remain. One theory is that Vasili was Bull Kathos's close confidant, while another says that he was his younger brother. Whatever the relationship actually was, the two were very close and shared everything with each other. And so both the ancients agreed that the world stone's power could never fall into the wrong hands if it was powerful enough to change the very nature of the Nephilim. So they agreed to devote their lives into protecting the world stone. Because of their unimaginable powers, Bull Kathos and Vasili had human followers that worshipped them as gods. As did most of the few surviving ancients that remained. Bull Kathos believed that their followers should be brought together and trained in the art of war and survivability so they could protect the world stone in the event of an attack. Vasily disagreed with this, however. He believed that to truly protect the world stone, the humans that were to protect it should understand the world completely, spiritually becoming one with sanctuaries of wildlife and plant life so they could understand the importance of their role. In our Elder Scrolls series, it seemed that when two people disagreed... Uh, on something, anything, war, anything, literally anything, anything, anything. <laughs> um, a war would be started. So, in a refreshing turn of events, the two brothers, or friends, agreed that each other's ideas made a lot of sense. So, decided to implement them both. So weird after doing Elder Scrolls, know, isn't yeah. it? They're like, yeah, good, good, good idea, buddy. <laughs> I see merits in one and merits in the other. Let's do them both. Vasily gathered up all of the bards, shamans and warrior poets out of the followers and travelled to the forest of Skosglin, while Bull Kathos took the rest of them and organised the very first tribe structure. In modern sanctuary, Bull Kathos's followers are referred to as barbarians and it's estimated that there are around 32 different tribes and everyone can trace its ancestry back to Bull Kathos himself. Once Bull Kathos had organised his worshippers' tribes, he began to teach them how he wished them to live, with the world stone's protection at the heart of their culture, religion and day-to-day -day life. To protect the land as thoroughly as possible, the tribes adapted a nomadic lifestyle, building very few permanent settlements. The few settlements they did build were around Mount Ariat to better defend the world stone. Which was hidden under the mountain. And in the surrounding area known as the Northern Steppes, an unforgiving frozen landscape. This landscape might be treacherous, but it does help mould the barbarian children into the powerhouses they grew up to become. Barbarians avoid using technology and magic at all costs, openly showing disdain for magic and spellcasters. The reason for this avoidance is they believe that magic or technology will weaken their resolves and distract them from their mission. Barbarian tribes are renowned for, all, for being always ready for battle, and their combat prowess and ferociousness and often their arrogance in battle. However, they are capable of incredible feats of strength. These feats are possible due to the harsh training they must go through as a child, along with their harsh surroundings. As children, they must hunt and skin the fierce monsters that roam the northern steppes. To do this, they must traverse the icy cliffs while carrying massive weapons that even most fully grown men couldn't actually wield. 
This training results in combat and survival skills that are unparalleled throughout Sanctuary, and their skin becoming so tough it's become as tough as leather. And that's not a simile. Their skin is literally as tough as leather armour. Their physical strength is heightened further by an ability to harness primal energies found on Sanctuary. At one point in his life, Bulkathos learned how to allow his spirit to linger on in spirit form, as did other ancients that followed the barbarian code, such as Talit the Defender, Madwak the Guardian, and Korlik the Protector. These three ancients then chose to stay after death to protect the World Stone, only allowing worthy fighters who could defeat them to pass into the World Stone's chamber. Once the World Stone was destroyed, these three spirits continued their duty by answering a new Nephilim's call to ancients skill. Seeing that spirits could linger, along with the rest of their ancient teachings, formed the barbarians' religion. They're surprisingly spiritual people, but they worship Bulkathos and these three ancients guarding the World Stone. The barbarians believe it's their life's duty to protect the stone, and their duty is fulfilled on death when they can finally be at peace. However, if they fail to do their utmost to uphold this duty in life, their spirit will linger in sanctuary forevermore, bound to protect the world stone eternally. Bulkathos's fate itself, however, is a mystery. He was still in the he was still alive in the year minus one eight zero nine, attempting to keep a man named Aldisian out of the world stone chamber. The fight was stopped between them, and Bulkathos had not been seen since, and theoretically he could still be wandering sanctuary to this day. As time moved on, the children of Bulkathos spread out throughout the entire Western Kingdom, forever wandering and constantly vigilant for threats to the World Stone. However, throughout the years and without Bulkathos's guidance, the tribes lost their unity and tribal wars became a usual thing. A barbarian named Warusk eventually managed to unite the tribe once more under his leadership. In honour of Warusk, he was given the title the Immortal King and allowed to sit on the Immortal Throne. The Immortal Throne is one of the most culturally important artefacts in barbarian culture, as before Warusk, only Bulkathos himself had been called the Immortal King and allowed to use the throne. A third person would eventually be granted this honour as well, um, but before it could be fully bestowed, uh, the barbarian culture was destroyed. Under Warusk's leadership, the tribes established the Council of Elders to try and prevent future tribal disputes. The Council of Elders are seated at Haragath, the nearest city to the World Stone, and consisted of three people, Ord Regar, Orst and Nilathak. Ord Regar served as a pillar of faith to the other council members. He firmly believed that the multiple prophecies that had existed throughout the various cultures regarding the end of the world were not to be believed. Unfortunately, when word of Diablo's first attack on Tristram reached him, he began to lose his faith, and when Bale attacked Haragoth, his beliefs were shattered altogether, leaving him pretty much a broken man. Orst was the wisest member of the council, and his vast knowledge didn't just cover barbarians, but also druidic magic and spells. The final member is Nilathak. Nilathak has necromancer-like powers, but isn't himself a priest of Rathma. My best guess he was granted these powers by the ancients to enable him to perform final rites on fellow barbarians and to communicate with the ancients' lingering spirits. In the year 1070, a man named Rakis travelled to the Western Kingdoms to spread the Zacharim faith. As his teachings spread, he founded the city of Westmarsh, becoming its first king. From this city, he began a holy crusade across the Western Kingdoms, frequently clashing with the children of Bulkathos. Rakis's soldiers began referring to the tribes as barbarians when they witnessed their opponent's savagery in battle and tribal lifestyle. The name stuck and spread across Sanctuary. The barbarians fought Rakis's armies off viciously. However, they were spread too thinly to effectively fight back and were so eventually pushed back to the northern steppes. However, the West Marsh army could never trade control of their homeland, and eventually Rakus's son took command of building a fortress called Bastion's Keep on the border of the northern steppes to keep the barbarian threat at bay. He led an army to try and conquer them once and for all, however no one returned and no further attempts of invasion were made. Unfortunately, barbarian culture was destroyed in the year 1266, 
Bale, Lord of Destruction, laid siege to the northern steppes in an attempt to corrupt the world stone, and his army marched upon Mount Ariat. He destroyed the barbarian's capital city, Centron, and the few other barbarian villages until Haragath was the last town standing in his way. The Council of Elders knew they had to act, so Orst cast a druidic spell of warding, meaning the only way Bale could get to the Worldstone Chamber was to fight the three ancient Nephilim. The spell was cast, but at great cost. Both Orst and Ord Rekar were killed in the process. Unfortunately, this spell didn't prevent Bale from entering the World Chamber. A band of heroes did eventually manage to kill Bale, but were unable to save the World Stone, and so to prevent its corruption from spreading, the angel Tyrrell had to destroy it, causing an explosion that decimated Mount Ariat, leaving the Ariat crater in its place. Most barbarians were killed, entire tribes being wiped out. The rest of the northern steppes became coated in toxic ash clouds. The damage was so absolute that people began calling them the Dreadlands. The barbarians' population was then soon reduced even more by a deadly rage plague that swept through the population. With their homeland destroyed and the world stone also destroyed, the remaining barbarians scattered. Most lost their faith, wandering sanctuary aimlessly. Some went insane, with at least one tribe acting almost like beasts to the point of cannibalism. Some, however, have not lost hope and still prowl Ariat's crater, striving to find a new purpose. The only positive in this destruction was the discovery of the Duretic text, Sail Fada. This book revealed everything we've just discussed, so the outside world finally understood the barbarians' noble purpose. But of course, the barbarians are not the only children of Bolkathos. The shamans, bards and warrior poets forward vassally into the eastern forests of Skossaglen, and we've not really mentioned them since. So Skossaglen is a vast wilderness full of untamed plants and wildlife. When they arrived, they severed their ties to the barbarian cousins and created an entirely new culture, language and life for themselves. They also made a vow that they would not return to the northern steppes until a direct threat to the world stone presented itself. While the druids did not share the barbarians' nomadic lifestyles, they also did not like populated urban areas like most other cultures. Instead, they erect great stone towers called druid colleges that are scattered across Skosglan. Their goal of protecting the world stone has also changed. While they know this is still important, they strive to keep all of Sanctuary safe. The greatest of colleges is called Tur Dulra. By it stands a mighty ancient oak tree called Glor An Fida. This would be easier if I could speak Gaelic. <laughs> the most worshipped source of guidance and teachings for the Druid. You're Scottish, you should be able to speak Gaelic. Under the Glor An Fyada <laughs> canopy, many Druids have honed not only their magical powers. Well, it's the first time in a long time I've done a Scottish accent. I don't think it was too bad. <laughs> Under the. It's going to need a minute. <laughs> Under the Glor and Fida canopy, many druids have honed not only their magical powers, but their martial skills also. Don't forget that although the druids have an outwardly calm demeanour, they do share ancestry with the barbarians, meaning they're still capable of great feats of strength. The druid source of magic comes from a way of thinking called the Kaioi Dura, which was taught to them by Vasily. The way of thinking holds the harmony of the plants and animals at Sanctuary at its core. They believe that the wildlife is a personification of Sanctuary itself. It is this way of thinking that forms the very basis of the Druid's values. By studying and practicing its nature, a bond is formed with nature itself, so absolute that it is said that Druids can talk to plants and animals themselves who then teach them more secrets of the natural world. Sorry, I know I didn't do a funky accent. I'm I'm not talking that. (laughs) Joe can have the spotlight. (laughs) (laughs) One of the secrets the wildlife of Sanctuary passed to the Druids is the art of dubstep, (laughs) a type of natural magic. (laughs) We'll spell it for you, but we're pronouncing it dubstep forevermore. I'm, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to do this syllable at a time. Dub her drio, drio act, dub a drio act. 
dub a Drio act. That's what I'm going for. Okay. That's a solid attempt. Not dubstep. <laughs> Not dubstep. <laughs> One of the secrets of the wildlife of Sanctuary passed to the Druids is the art of dub a Drio act. I said it so well before, and then I... Don't worry, I'll edit it in for you. It. <laughs> I'll, I'll cut your mistakes out. <laughs> <laughs> a type of natural magic which grows stronger the closer the user's bond is with the natural world. In fact, Dub Hadrio Act is the only kind of magic the druids will use, and they share in the barbarian's disdain for any other types of magic. Dub Hadrio Magic allows the user to control the elements of earth, fire, and wind. They can summon help from the animals and plants that they've sworn to protect, and most impressively, they can manipulate their own bodies to take on the characteristics and traits of these animals. Giant bear willies! <laughs> <laughs> Dupadriot's magic is so strong that even the mage clans, at their strongest, feared it, and feared the dru druidic powers, and seldom set foot in their homeland. Many tales have been passed down of how the Visjeri mages sometimes would try to enter the wilderness, but were soon turned away or killed by the druids. And that is everything you need to know about the children of Bulkathis. So, much like dubstep, might drop. Might drop. We're out. <laughs>